Hello, my name is Ailish Feely. I'm a genealogist from Kilishi in County Longford originally, but now living in County Roscommon. I've been asked by Longford Library Services to give you a short talk on tracing your family history. So your family tree consists of two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents and 16 great-great-grandparents and so on. If you add to that the children born to each generation, you can see how quickly your family tree can become quite large. Where do you start with your research? Well, you start at the present and work back in time. So start with yourself, record your parents and grandparents' name, and then start using online sources to work back in time to build up your family history. Use the information you have as clues to lead you to information you don't have. Talk to the oldest living relative within the family who may have information passed down through the generations. Memorial cards and newspaper notices are also a very good genealogical record source. Check out the local history where your ancestor resided. There may be some mention of your ancestors in that. Visit the local graveyard and have a look at family headstones relating to the family and record what their uh, inscriptions contain. Check out family lore, family stories about emigration, etc. Check to see if there are estate records relating to your parish or the parish your ancestors resided in. Your family members may have been grooms or gamekeepers or servants in an estate, and there may be records relating to those estates in some library or archive. Local libraries, as I mentioned, are a really important source of information. There may be parish histories, newspaper archives, uh, previous uh, research recorded by other individuals um, held in the local archive. Check out the immigration patterns for the local area and, most importantly, record your sources. Some of the free online sources we look at are the 1901 and 1911 census records, civil registration records, church parish records, land records, and also the National Archives genealogy site. This is the home page for the 1901 and 1911 census returns. They're quite simple to search. Just click into search census. Select your year, 1901 or 1911. In this case, we'll take 1911 as an example. Put in the surname you're searching. Select the county. And search. We're just going to take an example here. We look at Mary Farrell, who's living in Castlery Mountain townland in Maidu Parish in County Longford. Dury is the district electoral division mentioned. They organise the census returns according to district electoral division. Castlery Mountain is in, in uh, Maidu townland. So we see Mary Farrell, age 77 there, with her cousin Lizzie Mulfall and a niece Margaret Ann Mulfall. If you scroll along, you'll see that Mary was a widow. Uh, Margaret, or sorry, Lizzie was married. She was 12 years married, with three children born and one child living. And also living there was a Margaret Ann Mulfall, a niece. It's very important when looking at the census returns to actually look at the original record, which is under household return. And there you will see the form completed by your ancestors. Now, in this case, we can see that Mary Farrell was unable to write. So her mark was witnessed by the census enumerator, who was the local constable. Also take a look at the house and building return. And this gives very valuable information in relation to the type of dwelling the family inhabited. And you can see from that it includes all of the families in the townland. So if you want to get a snapshot of what the townland looked like in 1911 and who lived there, take a look at this return. Um, these set of columns here will give you information on the type of um, construction of the house, whether the walls were stone, whether the roof was attached, the number of uh, doors, windows, rooms, etc., and the class attributed to the household. So we can see this, the zero here uh, indicates that all of the houses had a attached roof in Castlery Mountain in 1911. You can also search the census returns by using the more search options. And in this case, to give you an example, we look for Longford Farrells living in other counties. So you just select all counties, put county of origin as Longford. And select search. And here you'll see those of the surname Farrell whose birthplace was County Longford who were living in other counties with quite a number of them there. You can just see um, this 
Serald P. Farrell, which is probably Gerald, is the transcription error, living in County Dublin, or in Dublin City, in Gardner Street. And he was a law student, a boarder in a house of a Thomas Farrell from County Roscommon and a Nanny Farrell from Wicklow. So it's important to look at those records also. The census returns give you very valuable information in relation to ages, um, family relationships, etc. But don't get too hung up on the ages indication in census records because people tended to say they were often younger or older than they actually were. So there are the census returns in relation to 1901 and 1911. This is the page for searching for civil records and the web page is irishgenealogy.ie. Now civil records are state registration of births, deaths and marriages and state registration of births, deaths and marriages for Catholic and all denominations started in 1864. There are marriage records online for non-Catholic denominations from 1846. And if you have a look at the home page on some of the information links, you will see uh, the dates for which these records are available on this site. Now to search the civil records, click into the civil record tab. And you enter the name of the individual you're searching for. I'm just going to put in a random name again. I'll put in the queue. And we will search in Longford Civil Registration District. Now, the civil registration districts um, are based on the old poor law union districts. And you will find in County Longford, you could have births, deaths and marriages reg registered in, say, Granard, Ballymahan or Longford. It depends very much on the area to which your, uh, the locality of your ancestor was connected from a registration point of view. We'll just select births, marriages and deaths in this case to give you some examples. We'll just scroll down and you'll see there they're divided by the event and by this we're looking at Longford Civil Registration District and by then you can see the time period so we have 1800s and 1900s so we look to see if there are any interesting records for the 1800s and we just look first for births see the birth of Bridget McHugh there in 1896 we we'll have a look at that this is just to give you an idea of the information contained in these records. Apologies for the slow internet. And this will show you a page from the superintendent registrar's book, or the registrar's book from the locality in which the birth was registered. So we can pick any of them there. There's a Bridget McHugh that we were looking at, and it seems to be. Um, can't actually make out the townland there. So Bridget was born to John McHugh of Longford and his mo her mother was Mary Ann McHugh, formerly Burke. So there you have important genealogical information there giving the maiden name of the mother of this Bridget McHugh. Her father was a labourer and he was the informant on the birth um, notification. Again you can see another one there is a John Thomas Farrell, son of a Patrick Farrell from Mullavorning. His mother was a hoey and the family were farmers. We'll go back in now, we look at a marriage record. So we look at this one here for a marriage of Michael Brady and Ellen McHugh. We'll have a look at the scanned record. Again, you'll see a number of marriages there. So you just pick out the relevant marriage to your the marriage relevant to your family. So we see here Michael Brady married Ellen McHugh on the fourth of November, eighteen eighty six, in the Roman Catholic parish or chapel at Drumlish in County Longford. Michael was a bachelor. Ellen was a spinster. They were twenty eight. Michael was a farmer. He was from Gaig in, in um, Drumlish. His father was James Brady, who was alive. Ellen was from Letter Gunnell and she was a daughter of Thomas McHugh, also alive. Both um, families were farming families. This information here relates to the witness uh, to the wedding and often it can be a family relative, a cousin or a distant relative. And here we have a John Cole and an Anne Whitney as witnesses. So there are the marriage records. 
Also, the death records are very important from a family history point of view. Some people tend to dismiss them, but they can contain valuable information. And we'll just look at a few examples here. We we'll look at the death of a Francis McHugh in um, 1899. He was age 64. See the image. Again, you need to scroll through it to find the record. And here we see Francis McHugh, seems to be Letter Gunnell. He was age 64, he was a widower. He died from Thysis, which is TB, which was rampant at that time in the Irish um, society. So he had TB for 12 months. He was certified by a medical uh, officer. And Michael McHugh, his son, was present at his death. So we know that um, Francis McHugh had a son called Michael. Often you will find it could be a nephew or a niece or um, another relative, which will give you further information and further clues. So there the birth death, and marriage records, a really important genealogical resource. Another important record source are the Catholic parish registers, which are available at registers.nli.ie. And they are searchable by parish name. It's not possible to search them by surname because they're not indexed. But we will look at a couple of examples here. I'm going to search Kilishi Parish to show you how the records can be searched. And here you see they have scans of the microfilms taken of the original parish registers. Uh, these were held for years in the National Library and in recent times have been put up online. So we're going to have a look at some baptisms here. Another important point to make is that many parishes started record keeping in the late 1800s, some in the late 1700s, and in some cases there were gaps in record keeping around the time of the famine. And you'll see in possibly in your own parish as well, gaps in record keeping at various times. In some cases, registers were lost as well. So um, we're very lucky to have these online, but they need to be used uh, in conjunction with other sources as well. So we'll just look at searching some events here in the Kilishi registers. We we'll look at some baptisms, we select a year, we we'll take maybe 1857, click, click a month here of July, and you press apply. And this will bring up the selection uh, that you have entered. Zoom in and start the task of deciphering the writing. In some cases the writing is pretty difficult to decipher, in others it's fine. So we can see a birth there, February, it looks like February the 17th, the birth of Maria, daughter of um, Catherine Higgins, or sorry, Pat Higgins and Mary Curran. And the sponsors were an Owen Curran and Ellen Higgins. Another birth there on 22nd, Mary, daughter of Pat Clavy and Anne Maloney. And the sponsors were Pat, or it could be Maloney or Maluli, Pat Malloy or Maluli and B. Farrelly. Again, difficult to make out the writing in some cases, so it's important to, to take the time to try and decipher it. But a really important record source, and it's really interesting to see the original entry in the baptism or marriage or death record in relation to your ancestor. So there are the Catholic parish registers, uh, free to access online. If you have ancestors from other denominations, for example, Church of Ireland, Methodist or Presbyterian, there are uh, sources available in relation to those record sets also, but many of them are not online. Presbyterian and Methodist records are available on some of the paid sites, but they're also available through the historical societies attached to those denominations. The Presbyterian Society, our historical society, have a library in Northern Ireland and you can write to them or email them and they will search the information for you for a small fee. The representative church body of the Church of Ireland have a library in Dublin and that is uh, available to visit and access the records there as well. So that's the parish records and uh, particularly the Catholic parish registers at the NLI uh, free source online. Griffith's Valuation is a really important record source from a genealogical point of view. It's available on askaboutireland.ie and again it's free to access. Griffith's valuation was a primary valuation which was the first full-scale valuation of property in Ireland and it was overseen by Sir Richard Griffith and his team 
and the results were published between 1847 and 1864, and it is one of the most important surviving 19th century genealogical sources. So we're going to search this by Griffith's places. It can be searched by surname also. And a point I'd like to make is that there are, va are variations in spellings of surname on this site and variations in spellings of townlands and parishes. So just be aware that if you don't find your ancestor, you may need to put in a variation of the spelling of the surname or the place name. So we're going to enter a place name here. I'm going to enter Ballinakill in County Longford. And we see the place name of Ballinakill, County Longford, the Barony of Moidu, and the Parish of Killashee. And this here will give you a list of the occupants of the, of the town land at the time of Griffith's valuation. Click on the original page and enlarge it. Now the Ballinakill town land is spread over two pages here. We'll just go into the first page and have a look at what is included. I need to scroll to the top of the page just to show you the columns on this record. The first column gives a reference to a map, which is the associated Griffiths valuation map, which we will have a look at in a second. The next townland gives a list of the occupants or occupiers of the townland. Then you have the immediate lessor, who is the immediate landlord of the tenant. The description of the tenement, you'll see house, house and office, or you could just simply see land or bog. The area and the valuation um, attached to that particular uh, townland, or sorry, the particular tenement. So to look at Ben Kill here, just enlarge it a little bit for you. You'll see it 1A on the map. We have a James Shaw who's living in a herd's house with offices and land. He's renting from a Mrs. Deverell, who's his immediate landlord. It appears to be about 156 acres of land that he's a tenant on. And the next tenant there is a, at 1B is a James McDonnell who is renting from James Shaw, who is a James Shaw at 1A. And he's renting a house and garden. So from looking at that record, I can safely say that James McDonald was working for James Shaw and he was renting a house and garden for him and helping him on the land. Probably a labourer, a farm labourer on the land. Patrick Cox is the same at 1C, house and garden. And you can see the chain of command there and the chain of income. So James Shaw was renting from Mrs. Deville, who was uh, receiving rent from James Shaw and other individuals in the townland, but James Shaw was renting to James McDonald and Patrick Cox. Again, you can see the other tenants there. Two A is James Shaw and two B is William Casey. I'll just go up to the top of the document then to look at the next or sorry, look at the next page to find the other tenants in the townland. And here we have the other tenants. Again, you can see that most of the townland was owned by Mrs. Deverell. We have a plot 3A and B, a, J, a John Wilson. And he's renting from ecclesiastical commissioners. They were the, the body who owned the graveyard and glebe lands in the townland. At plot 4, you had Samuel Wilson, who was... Now, they were just renting land. Notice just land as description of tenement there. Samuel Wilson may have been living in a neighbouring townland. Timothy McGann was at plot 5A, he was renting from Mrs. Deverell house, offices and land containing 83 acres. And then in plot 6A and B, the tenants of the townland had access to a turf bog. So what we're going to look at next now is the townland of Van Kill on the Griffiths valuation maps. And we should be able to see some of the um, plots we mentioned on that. So you click into map view. Now what you will be shown here are two one or two rectangles or squares. So it's a matter of just clicking into these points to find the actual town land that you're looking for. And each of the red lines you see encompass a small town land within, a, or the holdings within town land. So you see a darker red line encompass, which surrounds a town land and the lighter red lines then are the individual holdings. So I just need to find the town land of Belnakil now. And here we are here. So if you look closely at the town of Vanlickel, there you see the dark red line surrounds the actual townland, and each of the individual plots or tenements are surrounded by a smaller red line. 
In some cases, you might find a plot could t contain, say, for example, one there contains one A and one one C, two A. So if you look back at the original um, listing of occupiers of the townland, you can just relate them to the particular maps. If you look closely at the maps, you can see where there were small dwellings or houses. And in these cases, you may be able to pick up the original dwellings of your ancestor. To see the map in modern day format, you can scroll from historical to modern map. But one very simple way of looking at it is to look at it as a satellite image here. And there's the satellite image of Banakil Townland today. And if you're lucky, you'd be able to pick up the plot. If that was your ancestor's plot, you may be able to pick up the plot there, plus the original house that they lived on. And the ruins of that may be still in the area. So that's Griffith's valuations uh, maps and the um, list of ten tenements for your consideration and examination. Another important free online source to have a look at are the tidal plotment books, which are land records from 1823 to uh, 1837. They're a vital source for genealogical research for the pre-famine period, as it states here on the home page. And they were compiled, as I mentioned, between 1823 and 1837 in order to determine the amount which occupiers of farm holdings over one acre should pay in tithes or taxes to the Church of Ireland. Now, a tithe was a tax which was roughly one tenth of the produce of a farm or holding, and this was payable to the Church of Ireland at the time. This record set can be searched by a townland name or parish or family surname, or can be browsed as well. So we'll look at, have a look at a browse of the tide plotments. We'll go to County Longford. we we'll look at the parish maybe of Rathline. And you'll see there the townland names in Rathline. And from a local history point of view as well, you might find townland names in the tide plotments which are no longer in use today. So they're of interest from that perspective as well as from a family history perspective. And we look at the townland of Clunfower. And you can see there those who were required to pay tithes in the period 1834. We look at James Farrell here, and it will bring up a copy of the tithe book or record. Again, taking a minute or two to, to load. Thanks for your patience. Now, so we just enlarge the record. You see, Clonfower at the time was very heavily inhabited. These were the heads of households only who were listed. So it didn't list, didn't list the individuals living within a dwelling. So you can see Farrells, Callaghan's, Maguire's. Again, the spelling there is M-C-G-W-Y-R-E. So if you were spelling that with a M-A-G-U-I-R-E, you'd have some fun trying to find it. Martha's, Kenny's, Dinnigan's. It looks like Hedekin, Hopkins, Gibbons. Now, some of those names still appear in the townland. But many names will have gone, families may have emigrated, etc. So they're the tie the plotment records, and they're interesting from a family history perspective in that you can identify whether um, an ancestor or the family name still appeared in the area in the early 1800s. So they're the tie the plotments. The final free online source I'd like to recommend is the genealogy nationalarchives.ie website. This lists a number of other sources that may be of help from a family history point of view. We've already looked at the census and tide allotment records. This website includes further sources, including so soldiers' wills, will calendars, Catholic qualification and convert roles, etc. So take some time to go through those. You may find some other gems from a family history point of view. I hope you enjoyed this little podcast and that you have success in your research. And remember, we carry within us those who went before us. Thank you. Thank you.